do 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 that's the angle do do what do do that's the podcast so neat so all of this equipment is yours mm -hmm. very cool and how does this tie in if it does because i know your practice is also photography yeah like or maybe we save that question no no <laughs> i don't, we, I don't no, know no no what do you mean like how's it tie in <laughs> i don't know i mean i think like i know not as much about i feel so weird with these on it's um, all right you'll get used to them <laughs> Just, you know, when I'm looking at online, you have a really beautiful portfolio to my relative untrained eye. It's very like edi editorial and beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just interested because this is very like more about other artists than the work that you're doing. But you're definitely coming from an artist's perspective. For so sure. I'm just curious how they feed one another for you. Um, To be quite, quite honest, I think they're kind of separate. Mm hmm. Like the photography, I mean, it, it definitely merges in with the whole media aspect of that C angle and it being like, I'm trying to grow that to be a big media company. Um, but I guess the photography came first and then the podcast happened and it's just been kind of going down that route. Mm -hmm. um, and so in a way it's like creating like an ecosystem where it's like, because I'm an artist, I can relate and I'm kind of in that world. Mm -hmm. So I'm operating kind of both things, but at the same time, there are two separate worlds because it's like. I'll spend some days doing photography stuff and I'll spend some days doing all day just like listening to my own podcast and clipping them out and doing all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool. Interesting. And I think it makes, you know, if you're within the arts world or you have an arts practice, it definitely informs what sort of questioning or how you access speaking with other artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, 100% mm -hmm. because like I can feel the pain points. We all have the same pain points yeah. at the end of the day. You know, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter if you like paint or you like... Uh, or you take photos, we all deal with the same bullshit. Mm, yeah, definitely. Or the same experience or the same struggles or wants or just that practice that's unique to being an artist. Yeah. Well, I, actually, I'm, I'm putting the headphones up just a little bit more. Okay. Or if I'm too quiet, I can like really get close. Let's see. Okay. I think that's a little better for me. Okay. I sound louder. <clears throat> yeah, I can, yeah. I can hear you now. I'm not like okay. straining to listen to what you're <laughs> Sorry, saying. I'm reading my lips. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> no worries. But yeah, no, it, it, it all kind of ties together. And to be honest, like I've been having a lot of difficulties separating them as far mm -hmm. as like which one to give more time to. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that's very difficult. Yeah. But for me, I care more about that's the angle than I actually do my own photography stuff because um, that I feel like as a, as a solo photographer, a lot of people do it and it's cool i love it we're also in dc but i feel like there's like a limit to like do i want to be 40 doing event photography or do i want to like build <laughs> a giant like online presence and a brand and an events company and a giant podcast like that seems more appealing to me i guess on the business side mm -hmm. definitely i could see where that is and i think that it gives you more avenues and it's that idea of like that rising tide raises all mm -hmm. boats where you're serving at large the artistic community if it's a platform for them as well yeah so i like that rising tide raises all boats yeah but but it's funny to say because thinking about it more it all started because i was just trying to do my own photography exhibitions mm -hmm. and then i always made youtube content i was like oh let me just unify it all under this brand name and now it's just kind of taken on its own sort of thing where i'm producing other people's shows i'm doing this podcast and the youtube channel and all that stuff but that's great that's, I don't know, the magic of what <laughs> having the internet, having all of that. What does it look like from your perspective? Meaning like viewing upon yours or just creative practices as they evolve or Wait, as well, you like integrate into the, into the community or. I guess in general, like you said, like you, like you said, you thank you for the photography compliment, but then You're I welcome. also have this, like, it's just interesting that perspective because I really don't know how other people look at it. You know, I look at it in the sense, I guess, that it's two separate things, of course, that inform one another. I don't think you necessarily, oh, I don't know. I guess I don't know. But if you're a photographer, maybe you're more well-equipped and to, to come in and do a podcast and to have a better knowledge base about how the production should be or how the lighting should be. So I think that that's an immediate, when I think of it as an artist and as someone who's like, okay, logistically, how does it all work? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you think of that, you know, I think that you have very beautiful, sensitive work. And of course that's a little different than doing a podcast. Um, but you know, you think as an outsider, as a fellow artist, you're like, oh, well, there's a creative who's doing, wearing a lot of different hats, somebody yeah. who's engaged with the community and somebody who, um, 
is kind of working two different things, but things that inform each other. Mm. Well, I know it's really interesting. Something I actually haven't shared with anyone. It was a thought I had on my right here. And like you said, wearing those hats, like I'm juggling which one's more mm-hmm. important at all times. Cause you can't do two things at a hundred percent, right? Like something's got to suffer. Right. And so a kind of on the way here, I made an agreement with myself. I was like, you know, I think I'm going to put being an artist aside this year. Hmm. Like n- not, not making money and doing all gigs, but like I want to, my goal is to have two solo shows this year for my photography person. And, um, I was kind of like, damn, like if I'm trying to do this in April, I'm doing so many other things. There's no way I can do this. And I was like, I have to focus on one. So I just kind of made the agreement. I was like, you know what? This is the year of growing. That's the angle. I think it's a great goal. I just kind of made that peace with myself. And sometimes it is that factor of like, And I think to some degree, all artists do this. You'll like agonize and agonize no matter what it is and want to like really, at least for myself, I feel like I really harp on one thing and you wonder if it's done. You wonder if it's right. Does it need more work? And at some point you have to just choose it, finish it, do it, drop it or whatever it has to do so that you can stop being anxiety ridden and agonized over whatever that right creative next step is, whether it's deciding to focus more on podcasts or whether it's the direction you're going or the piece you're working on or whatever it is. I think that's something that ties everyone's practice together as artists. Yeah. I feel like there's always something that you want to do and what's actually happening and like what is naturally happening in your life. (laughs) Do you ever experience that? Definitely. And I think, you know, and talking about you wearing a lot of hats, I think a lot of artists do, and it can look very different, but sometimes it's like, oh, do I need to do grant writing or I'm applying for shows or are murals part of your practice or... Right, there's so many things, like even within that you could be doing. Right, and it's not not what you should be doing, but there are many facets of being a person who has a creative career, especially if that whole career is you are the business and your hustle drives it, Yeah, how you choose to access and devote your time. How do you split your time? Do you, are you just like spending all day painting? Like, how do you, how do you like, what's your difference in differentiating there? Um, the big part of the day is that studio practice. And so that conventional eight hour day you think of as a work day is pretty much just working, whether that's drawing Um, My practice starts digitally in the sense that I'll lay everything out first on Photoshop and fool around till the composition is right. Um, So sometimes it's that. There's also applying to different opportunities, which I'm sure you're familiar with, and we all kind of are, but there's a lot, a huge written component where you need to put together your proposal. Your statements are more or less always done, but they're also kind of a work in really? progress. I feel like that's a uh, like a painter thing. Like I, that's not, I feel oh, like really? that's not so much a photographer thing where like I'm applying to grants in walls yeah. and stuff like that. Like I can't just like wheat paste a photo on a wall and be like, here's my mural. You know? <laughs> here's what I do. Although I see all the time, you know, there's calls for photographers and I imagine the submission is much the same in that there's probably that five to 20 mm-hmm. image. I'm trying to set these somewhere. They're oh, not Just throw them on the table. Just on the, the table. table. Yeah, okay. don't worry about it. <laughs> I was hearing them clink on the metal chair. I was like, who's that picking up? Um, but I imagine it's the same. Again, it's like two worlds that touch and don't touch. I'm not yeah. so familiar with the, with the world of photography, but um, I do see calls in some of the same places. I'd be looking for calls for fine arts So, um, but there's always that, that you're working on and you're always trying to stay ahead and maybe you're making, um, a proposal for something or maybe it's a mural project and you need to pitch a couple different ideas. But my main practice and my first truest love is that traditional studio practice. So a lot of the day is drawing. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause looking at your work, I'm never sure if it's digital or (laughs) if you're doing it by hand, it's that good. Like it's that, it's that like tight. Thank you. That's what I go for. And my intent is to have it toe the line of both, Mm. you know, to have a certain um, sterility to it. You know, the, like I said, it does start digitally and how I compose it and um, wanting that flexibility to play and play and play with it until I'm happy before I start drawing and using it as a reference. Um, But I, I pursue creating that artwork that sort of the hand is there. If you see it in person, it's clearly created by fine arts, traditional materials. Um, but the effect is quite smooth and homogenous and it. 
like I said, kind of toes the line of whether it's handmade or something that might be digital. Yeah, and it it does feel very surreal. Like last night I was looking at your work and I was like, oh, you know, I need to know more. And of course I already (laughs) know a lot, but I was like, let me just look more, you know. And I'm like, it's so surreal. You draw people so lifelike. Thank you. Yeah, and you also draw really lifelike memes, which is amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Love memes. I know. How how did, did you just, like, are you a meme artist? Or is that, I I don't want to insult you and say that. No, it's not an insult at all. I mean, I guess, yes. Handcrafted memes. It's like. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of meta. Right? Um, Yeah, although at the moment I'm setting sort of that aside and not, you know, completely saying goodbye to it forever. But memes, there's such a weird space to work in. Yeah. Um, Partly because you're sort of talking to one audience. You know, there's people who who are more internet literate than others. And then Very true. A, a whole part of the world and a whole part of the art community that it doesn't land. They don't have a reference point for it. Um, and then you enter the conversation of like, is artwork successful? If people are sort of having a reference point for what you're talking about or not. Um, That's interesting that you say that where I didn't even think about that. You're, if, if you get the references with your work, then it has a way more profound impact than if, if you're just yeah. looking at, you know, uh, like one of your big ones is like that girl's <laughs> butt with the likes. You know, if you're just yeah. like looking at that, but I feel like most people will get that. Right. Most people might not get like the crying Jordan meme or mm, right. or the Circe meme or anything like that. And sort of don't understand the currency of it, mm-hmm. you know, how it's been used and, and its intent and its purpose. And there are some instances where I won't say like where these images were applied to and all that but you probably know the meme it's like that crazy ex girl with whose face is like you know who i'm talking about <laughs> yeah and the place thought it was a, a really vulnerable portrait of myself <laughs> <laughs> and so it's not a huge deal but it definitely i think like that's the difference where um that's kind of a joke in itself, though. Like, yeah. if, if someone doesn't get the reference, <laughs> right. like it's like, what is your interpretation of right. of that? And they think like in the the way I've drawn it, she's like in a sewer, and it's a play on the movie It. And yep. There were a lot of It memes, and they just thought <laughs> that it was me in the sewer, and it was like a statement about how, I don't know myself. It's hard. I don't know how they're reading it because they're reading something. I don't know. So that's where it it operates in an interesting space. Um, but that's why I think it's that's why I think it's awesome though is because of that duality of like if, if, <laughs> if you're if you're a troll on the internet like we clearly are then you're like oh my god no yeah. way like someone did this but if you're like trying to be profound as right. an art viewer you're gonna find something totally different you're like she just feels so low and yeah. slimy in that sewer <sighs> and that big smile on her face is really <laughs> Was that Lindsay Lohan, the girl that's in the sewer? Is that, is no, that her? No, it's, um, I can't think of the actual girl's name and, you know, where exactly the picture comes from, if it's like a still of a video or what. Um, but, you know, you see it, it functions as like your crazy ex girlfriend. Mm. I don't know if that's like the name of the meme, but um, it's out there. And most people who are on the internet, I feel like, would know it and have familiarity with it. But how, how did you start? doing like that kind of work like how did you start creating that style like the you know uh sort of almost i don't want to say accidentally but i feel like in my practice when i'm thinking about new work i'm generally Mm -hmm. making three four drawings before it turns into like something that I've recognized as more intentional or a very specific direction I want to be going. Mm -hmm. And at the time, um, you know, it was around 2016. So it's not like memes are just starting or it's not like, you know, these things aren't existing. Um, But I think that they were colliding in a new way. Um, What was colliding? Kind of like memes and maybe the idea the mainstreaming of the idea of the power of the internet in the sense that there is like all that fuss, all that fuss, very important, Um, you know, election interference or, I mean, just a ton of things I think coming together at one time on timelines. It's like, it's like a friendly commentary on a very relevant thing. Right. And so that's kind of what started me thinking about it. And I was making drawings, kind of thinking a little bit about the internet and, 
image inundation and social media, but then sort of whittling it down to being like, well, how do we consume these things? And mostly it's on our phones. So Mm -hmm. then I thought, you know, it should be the size of an iPhone screen. Um, And then thinking about memes in a way that takes them very seriously. You know, I think that they're funny, but I think, and they're silly and they're, not so serious, but they are, you know, there's something I think that's very resonant about them. You know, everyone sort of self selects them and likes them and shares them. And there's something within that, that is important or emotionally resonant for everyone, even if it's something stupid, um, like grumpy cat or whatever, I don't know, take your pick, yeah, whatever it is. Cause at some point someone crafted that meme, no matter, it's right. not just like some computer generated no. thing. Someone had to put that that graphic with that text and right. put it out in the world. Right. And so there's that level of, okay, there's that maker who t- made this aesthetic choice, whether it's a joke or a laughing at someone crying, or I don't know what, again, it could be anything yeah. or everything. Um, and then shares it. And then everyone agrees. And then you think, well, that's crazy. If you have millions or thousands or whatever the number might be agreeing and sharing or commenting or having strong opinions on something, you know, it's not nothing. Yeah. It's like a meme is a way to like share your viewpoint without being like abrasive about it. Like it's, it's, it's like a new social construct that people can share, I share an idea on something without it mm-hmm. being their sort of opinion. Definitely. And there's a level, too, of ambiguity about it. If you say words, it's it's there. It's permanent. It's written down. And if it's a photo, I think you can see it in many different lights. But you're right. It's opinion expressing. And if it's Michael Jordan crying, you sort of know what the sentiment is, even if you don't know maybe what the image is clipped from. Did you see him cry again recently? I, I didn't watch. The and he Kobe referenced funeral, the meme. But he did. He, he did. referenced. And he was like, you know, <laughs> reflecting on how many crying pictures there would be. But that's what it is, you know. And so by proxy, there's this relationship. I mean, Michael Jordan already has being a celebrity and a very talented, you know, athlete. But then this backward-looking, self-referential meme that he knows he lives as. Right. And there are people who are sending that meme who, like, weren't alive to see him play. (laughs) You know, aren't, like, never saw him as an active athlete. And so I think that it's, it's just interesting. I don't know. I find it fascinating. You know, what does it all mean or say about us? Or, you know, I just think culturally so much exists online Mm -hmm. um it's worth looking at and laboring over and taking a little time with and dissecting even if it seems at surface level to be something that's a little bit you know no i i i totally agree with you it's like when you it's serviceable funny but when you really think about it it's like what what is this doing Mm -hmm. what is the function of this piece of artwork i guess i I guess it is i guess it is at the end of the day it is i think so right yeah and and they're always evolving oh yeah you know? Yeah. And some of them make a weird comeback. Some of them don't. Some of them age better than others. Some of them, you know, their meaning changes completely. It's evolution all the time. You know what I looked up last night in preparation <laughs> for this podcast? I don't prepare that much. But you right. know what I looked you know what I looked up? And please don't don't be insulted by that. No, me. I'm not. It's just I think my it's style. good. I kinda like it when it's Yeah. Whatever. But um I tried finding the first meme. Like, what was the first oh, yeah. meme? Do you know? No, no. And that's, uh, yeah, who could say? What could you say is, like, first? I Did, think, was there an answer? So there was an answer, and it was weird because no one's ever seen it. But you could also say, it, like, an old comic strip was a meme, mm-hmm. right? Because they were kind of sure. boxes. But when you talk about internet-based square memes with text, I think it was either the college kid with the backward hat when he's like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Is well, it like the Louis Vuitton? No, no, no. It's like he's it's like it's like he's got really like the back. Drunk. He looks like a bro. Or, or remember that one guy? His face was like this. His face was like, <laughs> yeah. And he's all okay, sweaty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it was either that guy, the college bro who looks like a stoner with the backwards hat, yeah. or it had to be um like that. Is it like a Reddit or four chain? It's just like a. It's like a. It's. Wow, and then Pepe just came into yeah. my mind. That might be an early one too. It is, and it's weird. Because that was someone's art, right? It was a web comic, if I'm not mistaken. Pepe the Frog? I think so. Yeah. And then it got clipped as a meme, and then it got 
this sort of like political baggage and then right? it got and, what and so like there? someone you i don't i don't even remember i don't even know if it's like worth <laughs> diving into but i think it just is like that's the perfect okay. uh, arc yeah of meme life you know where it starts out as someone's art <laughs> then it's a really popular meme then it's like somehow tied in, you know, to all these negative political things. It, it became then, like a symbol for racism, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, I believe so. That, but I'm sure that webcomic guy could have never in a million years, if I have my facts right, I very well could not. But it's I okay. We're not it, on the record. Yeah. Don't worry. Uh, um, but, you know, so that to me is all kind of, of fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that meme really transcended. Like, it made its way into mainstream media. Mm -hmm. Where like, they displayed Pepe, and all of a sudden you're racist. Right. It's like, whoa! It's like this. You guys clearly don't know where yeah. this is coming from. It's like, where is the line for that? But right, exactly. Memes. And that's, I guess, what I mean when I was thinking for the first time. All these things that were existing all the while mm -hmm. were suddenly hitting the mainstream and colliding. And Russia's using memes to do this and that. And it's like, whoa. Right? You Did know. you hear about any of that stuff? I mean, other than the news, you know, that, that you hear, I couldn't necessarily say, like, they're using this meme or that yeah. meme. But I just think that it generally speaks to the power of these things, again, that are sort of thought of as silly, mm -hmm. are not so silly if it's part of, like, a whole political... Uh, like a political uh, agenda in a way. Like, right, like, agenda is the word I'm searching these, for. Like these yeah. funny little square pictures all of a sudden become real serious when it's tied to a bigger issue mm -hmm. you like like uh like a trump meme you know people mm -hmm. love those or oh, yeah. i'm trying to think of like what a bit really popular meme right now is because i find it's so hard for me to think of memes because i'm so on my tiktok shit now i just got a tiktok <laughs> <laughs> it's wild right yeah that's yeah, it's gotta a be, lot of fun though that's got to be a fountain of content for you too yeah kind of although it's odd because it's not so it's almost more like ideas and actions very dance based it right? is, Do you, it <laughs> it's is. hard to like you know translate something like that uh but yeah tiktok's a whole other world <laughs> but they're they're kind of like in the same vein though where it's like a quick punchy oh, yeah. joke where it's right you know there's usually for the most part, besides like the big booby girls dancing, like mm -hmm. there's there's some amazing creators down there who have some funny stuff, right. and it's usually like a moment that's hilarious, and they're right. making fun of something, commentating on something just like a meme would just it's video right. based now. Exactly. I mean, in that way, they all are sort of memes, and I mean, then there's even that interesting political layer there because TikTok, right, is very affiliated with the Chinese government. Is it? Uh, yeah. I heard. Wait, really? I believe. I mean, I'm making all these statements, well, uh, but I'm pretty sure it's it's quite affiliated in some way. What have you heard? I don't know. I don't. I, I hesitate to say more, you oh, know, okay, and get okay. incorrect facts. But I'm I'm pretty sure. I don't know. Can, can you cut it if I'm wrong? <laughs> yeah. Wasn't there an Wasn't there an app? It was like the age app where people were like, "That's a mm -hmm. Russian app." Yeah. That was kind of weird too. How that, that whole was. thing happened. It was like really fun for a day, and all of a sudden, everyone's like, and then "Russia everyone's collusion." Like, Wait a minute. <laughs> Yeah, that was they weird. They millions of her age progress <laughs> photos. Yeah, I don't know. And that too, it's all weird. And it's like, that's just where the, the internet is. It's so very the Wild West. What happens to all these TikToks? Right. Where do they go? How do they live? I Sometimes, and this is where I'm like, this is the age <laughs> difference, being that a lot of the people on there are really young. And I'm like, wow, you know, I can't imagine making some of these TikToks and they're not they're not going to go away for the rest of your life. You're one right. day you're going to be 40 and like your TikTok legacy will still be there. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Like uh, memes are kind of anonymous, but your TikToks aren't. No. I yeah. never really thought about that until just then. It was like, there's no branded TikTok creators. You know, there's no like famous meme creators. Sorry. There's no famous meme right. creators. I meant, this, that's what I meant to say. Right, right. But on TikTok, there's plenty, like you said. Yeah. Names where you'd say you're like TikTok famous. Yeah. Yeah. So, and again, like it lives on and whether it's owned by whoever, it's owned by someone. It's going in a cloud somewhere, Pandora's right? Pandora's box is open. Right, No yeah. one cares who owns at this point. Right, yeah. And it matters, but I guess it does, doesn't matter, not functionally. Yeah, it's it's going to be weird for some of those kids where it's going to be like, Mom, how'd you get famous? Well, I was 16 yeah. and I had my ass and titties out and I and did a couple so... dances and uh, here we are, and son. here we are. That's how I bought this mansion because we got a couple brand deals. And I'm like, and you know what? Good on you. Right? You do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I don't think that there's necessarily like 
nothing wrong with it, you know? I hate the perspective where people... I feel like maybe it's not as cool anymore to be down on millennials. For a while, it was, like, really cool to talk bad about millennials if you weren't one. You yeah. Know, like, talk about avocado toast or whatever. But now it's, like, Gen Z's turn. But it's so annoying when people... I don't know. They always want to kind of, like, crap on whatever is the new generation or think there's this big degradation of, like, how people should be or not as x y and z is we all used to be yes yeah, when you notice the shift they're yeah. like what is that? i don't like that right and i'm like i don't know if you can if you can monetize your tiktok dance to pay for your house or college or whatever you want like good on you it's happening they're all moving yeah. to la and like moving into mansions together and doing like big <laughs> brain deals and all wow. this stuff yeah they're they're internet savvy in a way that anyone before is not what i think is really yeah. interesting about it and internet culture in general is that it gives creators an opportunity to be very successful at very young ages. Mm -hmm. Like when I was growing up, there really was no outlet no. to really reach millions of people. If you were just no. a funny dude, like you would have to go through like a, a, a way through that was conventional, mm -hmm. like TV or whatever. Like now you yeah. could be 15 and be really talented and you're making more than your parents in, like right. in a month off YouTube. Right. And you don't need an agent. You don't need right? to leave your house necessarily don't yeah no it's very interesting i imagine we're more or less the same age where you grew up in a world without all of that to a point i'm 29 yeah you don't have I'm, to say I'm, your age but you're well i'm 32 um I say. so more or less that's an awesome age to say so yeah, yeah um <laughs> we're in our prime yeah oh, whatever these grays are in their prime too <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah it's 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 interesting to 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 know a bit of the world prior to all of that. True. And even being in college, it was sort of at its infancy. You know, YouTube was around, but it was nothing like it is now. Because you went to Corcoran, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read that in your bio. I was like, yeah. whoa, no, no yeah. way. That's impressive. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Man, that's an awesome school. Yeah, it was very, it was cool. It's interesting because like, when you think of art schools now, it makes me wonder, are they teaching you how to market yourself on social media? Because that's a very that's relevant a really conversation. That's a good question. It definitely was not part of it when I was there. I graduated in 2010. So, again, it's like it was there, but it was so early on. It was nothing like it is. the internet is now. But also there is definitely not that idea of like, how are you an entrepreneur of any type that leverages the internet for exactly yourself. right because generally speaking it's a free marketing tool of course if you're building a website or whatever it's not but that just wasn't it just didn't exist that mindset so i hope and i would imagine now that it is but it's almost as if if, if you're 18 now entering in college are you are you better positioned than a professor to teach that class you know what do you mean Oh, you mean like like you could be more student, famous? Like you could be more yeah, famous you could your theoretically, yeah, have a better handle on how to use the internet to benefit your art or whatever career than your professor might. What, what maybe, did maybe? I'm just curious from your experience at Quirkin, What did they teach you? Like, what did they tell you was your like sort of planned route to become a successful artist? You know, you know that part. It wasn't a, uh, the big emphasis, I would have to say. And I don't think that that's the only art school where that is um, how it is. A lot of times it's that emphasis on sort of technique and craftsmanship and artistry and concepts and all of these things, but then how you're functionally walking out the door to be a working artist and how to position yourself, how to file those taxes, how mm -hmm. to, I mean, again, it's even so different. Like I remember getting a printout of places that were resources for artists versus now there's tons of art call websites or whatever. And it was overpriced, I'm sure, too. What's that? The prints. Like it was it, like the... Oh, well, there was just like a computer okay, printout okay, right. um, in the sense that like, here's here's a pamphlet of resources. You oh, know? yeah. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it got touched on a little bit, but that honest to goodness preparedness for how to access your art career, whatever that might look at, like, wasn't um, 
a huge emphasis, I would mm. say. Cause I didn't go to art school at all because, right. well, I didn't know you could go to photography art school. Right. I didn't know, I didn't even know it was a thing. I remember being in my, literally, I have vivid memories of being in my guidance counselor's office. Mm-hmm. And it was my first year of college. I'm undecided. I'm there because my mom wanted me to be there. You know, YouTube was hardly a thing at that point, right? Right. And she goes, so Bruce, what do you want to do? I said, I want to do photography. And they go, well, we don't really have a photography course. We have this weird course that you can create your own curriculum. And I was like, oh. Uh, but then they're like, we have an audio engineering course. And I was like, well, that's my second best thing. Let me do that. Right. So it, it's it's weird, but it also brings me to the conclusion. It's like my opinion of schooling and let alone in the arts feels so bleak with all the resources and knowledge that's out there because you go to school because they are the resource of knowledge. They have something mm-hmm. that no one else has. Right. And they teach it to you in that way. That's why that's why you're paying for their expertise. But now you could get advice from someone who's more successful from your teachers via YouTube or mm-hmm. online courses and for a fraction of the price on your own time. Yep. It's so crazy. Like, And that's all changed since we've been in college. Yeah. I mean, really and truly, it's like probably the last 10-ish years, I would say. Yeah. It's completely fascinating and revolutionary. And I think it's something, I mean, I don't speak from a position of expertise, but I think that is something that probably all colleges think about. Right. How that knowledge set exists <clears throat> outside of sort of the rarefied air of any sort of institution. True. And even those professors, you know, imagine if you are part-time, you know, you might think about doing your own YouTube channel or I don't know. I just think there's so many ways that information gets out there Mm -hmm. and people can access it and it has big effects on, I mean, everything. I mean, we're talking just education, but I'm like, that's how everything is. And I don't, I don't have to necessarily, something goes wrong with my car. I can hop on YouTube and figure it out. Yeah. Theoretically. Have never done that. <laughs> Same. I'm not changing <laughs> but, my brake pads off of YouTube. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not either. But you could if you, you could. were a, a reasonably like savvy person and had the materials. Yeah. You wouldn't have to be a, a mechanic to do it. There's mechanics on YouTube telling you how to do it. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. It's yeah. Something, it's something that's like really think about the culture we live in at points mm-hmm. and really think about how rapidly it's changed just from an artist's perspective as well. Because, mm-hmm. how like, what's your opinion on like art galleries and in your your work with placements on that? Because I feel like the nature of your work, art galleries might look at it a certain way. Yeah, I think it it depends. Um, I think that feeds back into the thought of how your work is being read, mm. and I think then it's like, okay, well, what sort of gallery is it, and. You know, every gallery is different anyway. Some value more abstract work. Some Uh, like more, you know, there's always a preference. Um, But then within that preference, are people really savvy about memes? Um, So that's really a toss-up and something that I've thought about quite a lot. And the work that was very meme-based has segued into a different series that's still referential to the internet and how we experience it, but less contingent on specifically memes and digital pop culture language. Um, So hopefully it's something, you know, for me that I'm interested in anyway, but is a little bit um, broader. Like what, could you give me like an example or something? Like um, like I'm kind of confused on that. Yeah, Uh, I know. And it's hard because like we're talking here and there's nothing like 2C of it. But, you know, the first body of work is all iPhone screen sized drawings, most specifically about memes. Um, But the work that I'm doing now is much bigger. It's 15 by 15. Um, And it's meant to kind of access, like I was saying, um, some of that imagery or image availability it's meant to kind of play on the experience of being inundated with this stuff all the time so you know you can think about all that you can hear or see there's podcasts there's x y and z you're Mm -hmm. hearing about you know something that's very anxiety inducing take your pick climate change whatever yeah anything um and trying to translate and represent that um you know, using these components, you know, sourced imagery off the internet. So, um, 
Again, it's hard to describe all of these. Without yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm just <laughs> sound so, I'm, only, but I, I'm just so curious because, like, when I think about the idea that you know, and I, and I, I could tell a little bit that like it bothers you that some people don't fully get it. You know, maybe and maybe I'm wrong, but like, if someone doesn't get the reference to the culture, it's almost like as if you know the the, the equivalent could be like a impressionist painting or not impressionist, mm-hmm. but like a, um, a more abstract painting. Not everyone's gonna get that either. Right. And so I think about that a lot. You know, I don't always walk up to art and think, you know, I, I get it. You know, I know <laughs> everything there is to know about right. it. You know, I think to some degree, even walking up to any piece of art or whatever and thinking that is a little, it's, you just can't. Um, but I do think, you know, when you're functioning in a, in a space, art is unique because it so relies on that viewer participation um and it doesn't necessarily bother me that people don't don't get it because i think you can even appreciate how something is created or how it looks Mm -hmm. just the aesthetic without knowing that this is a reference to this but um you know you hope that your art is something that is impreci- appreciated and engaged with and is something that can be shared by everybody. You know, I don't necessarily want to close off any part of the audience just because they're not, like, into memes. Mm-hmm. You know, and even beyond thinking about an audience, for me, it's like I don't necessarily forever only want to be making meme art. Of course. Um, I don't mean to pigeonhole you as that either. No, not it's at all. It's just the majority of what I yeah. see at this point. Right, right. Um, and so it's just kind of thinking about it. Thinking about making what to me is fulfilling and interesting, mm-hmm. but also something that's accessible to and by everyone. Mm. Um, yeah, accessibility to art is, is always important. Mm-hmm. Like even, even Esteban's work that we're sitting in here, it doesn't... Re- I, it's good, but it doesn't feel accessible to me. How do you mean? Like, it's very like, it's very racially charged. So for me, from a white dude's perspective, I get the I get the perspective. I, I agree with them, you know. But it's not something that I would like want to hang because I don't feel that sentiment. Like, so the accessibility I think is there, and we all get it. But maybe that's everyone's art in general. Is there's always going to be a degree of it's not accessible for someone. Yeah, I'm, I have one of his pieces in my house. Um, well, I mean, I'm not saying <laughs> I'm just I, I'm, I'm just trying to make a quick reference right. to like how that could be right. But that's I mean the point that beauty is totally in the eye of the beholder. True, and that's something that I believe. I think that no matter what you're making, you're for someone to want to put it on their wall. You're waiting for someone who has the same conceptual and aesthetic value set as you to come along and see your work. Mm. And that is a rare person anyways, I think, you know, for someone to, to feel so deeply about what you've made that they make the investment to take it home, you know, and and who that person is, they're not everybody on the street, no matter what you're making. Yeah. That's true. But. I, I do feel like a little bit that kind of comes down to the fact that if it's like an original piece too, because I feel like someone's more likely to invest in you as a person if if it's like a uh, like a print or like a giant piece like this right here like this is hand painted mm-hmm. probably goes for hundreds maybe th- probably thousands of dollars you know as opposed to like a smaller print of it someone's probably more likely to like hang that up and it's a little more accessible in that way. Yeah, I think it's definitely one of those things that a lot of artists think about printing. Right prints of original pieces so that you have something at every price point for people you know not everyone can necessarily invest a thousand dollars but maybe they can one day you know or they want a piece now to have and to value and know that it's something someone originally created but it's a print because that's you know where you're at or some people really love prints. Some people really love originals. It's just like... I might have gotten it wrong where you were going with that as far as someone who really messes with your style and aesthetic. How do you mean? Well, because you're saying like that person to come along and be like, oh, I really love her style, her aesthetic. Mm-hmm. I'm going to buy this and put it on my wall as mm-hmm. opposed to, you know, the minutia of prints and originals. Oh, yeah. That's just the world <laughs> I'm so locked into right now. Yeah, I know. I'm dealing with these art shows. Oh, right. But I love it, so. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, there's several ways it can go, you know, so... 
Yeah. That's why I love your, I, I love seeing your stuff at Gouge because I've seen it a few times. And the first time I saw it was the first time I met you. And even though I remember, it's okay because I have the same experiences at art shows. <laughs> but it's so many people. Yeah, you're the rock star right. for the night. You know, you, you, you're not supposed to remember everyone. Um, but it was so fascinating that like everyone has these big things and you have these iPhone size screen mm-hmm. original paintings. And I got up close to them. And literally that night, Every one of your pieces, I took a photo and shared it on my Instagram story because I thought it was that good. Thank you. I did it with like one other piece in that show. But every piece <laughs> you had in that show, I was like, this is hilarious. This is hilarious. This is hilarious. I was like, someone gets it. Yeah, which feels amazing. Yeah. You know, you always hope for, as an artist, that somebody will find that meaning and resonance and the intent of what you've created will come through, mm-hmm. you know, and they... Because a lot of the ones that I've done are meant to be double entendres or they sort of have a meaning or not all of them necessarily are so deep. Some of them are just kind of a play on images or words. But, you know, I'm hoping that someone comes along for whom all of it is something they're familiar with. And so they understand or like or think is funny or find levity and or the message in whatever it is I've created. Mm. Can we talk about that mural you did? For powwow? Oh, sure. That, that was so cool. Thank you. How did that happen? Um, That was, I'm not sure how necessarily my name got thrown into the hat because I had not done a mural prior. That was all Kelly, who's awesome, and he's the um, coordinator for powwow here mm-hmm. in D.C. And I think that they do mix it up and invite folks who are not street artists or muralists to be a part of it. So I guess my name got thrown into the hat. I can't speak to that process. Um, But it was really a lot of fun and a really informative interesting um challenge for me you really? know i have not we're talking about i'm drawing at the scale of an iphone <laughs> and the wall is 100 <laughs> feet by i forget now nine or 12 feet tall so a considerably larger canvas yeah it was huge huge and for me part of deciding what to do is the challenge of you know creating these drawings is very time consuming you know even if they're quite small they can take several hours the ones i make now can often take at least a month if depending on how um, detailed they are. And so I was like, gosh, I, I, I don't even know where to start thinking about how I would render something realistically that big. You know, you only have 10 days and it rained a Whoa. ton. So actually functionally there was less than 10 days. So um, I decided <clears throat> the best way to access it since, you know, the work I make is very internet based, meme based was to just choose some of my favorite family friendly you have to be um of course <laughs> memes to put up there so that ideally it's something funny and fun and lighthearted but hopefully somebody follows up and looks at my work and they think oh okay here's where the two touch you know this is a wall of memes but that faces the work which is also very meme and internet centric um so it was a lot of fun. It was interesting because the people on Reddit really hated it. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. I would have expected them to love it. No, they like, were like, I feel like you should be the champion. Cringe. Oh no. Oh my. Oh no, no. They were they were big mad. Um, which is fine. Really? What were some of the comments? Were they just like Oh, they just hate it. They just not everyone hated it. I, I don't wanna speak like <laughs> for everyone. But yeah, they just they just didn't like it. I mean, it's interesting because I think there's not so much of a face of a person who does it, you know. There's a lot of perceptions about, like, what what powwow is and, like, who participates. And I think there's a certain idea that it's, like, a bunch of out-of-towners coming to make murals, which is not... Everyone on that trail, at least, is from the DMV. We're all local, and many of them at one time or another did live in D.C., but maybe, maybe they have kids now and they live in Nova. I don't know. Um... So it's all locals there. So I think there's like one level where if people think you're not from around here. But also I think it was just like there's a lot of, um, how to describe, like when people are really like on the internet, they feel kind of protective of that and they sort of see it as this like co-opting. Like you're making it mainstream or something. Right, yeah. And, um, And I don't know, maybe that's not wrong. I'm not sure. Maybe it's like... I, fuck those Reddit people. I'll be, <laughs> fuck all you Reddit people who hate now because I thought no. that was the best. Like, literally, that was one of my favorite murals of all time. Like, Thank you. It is, I loved it. I, I didn't even know you did it until it was like late at night. I'm like f- fastly going through that that bike path, like trying not to get robbed because it's sketchy at night. 
Uh, well, when we, we'd be painting there at night. There was like people around. Uh, yeah, but, but it was us all painting. I, guess. I was geeking out. I was like, did someone paint Angry Patrick on a wall? Like, is that the? Is this my butterfly guy? I was like, I was like, is that pop? Is that was it Pop Tart Cat? Is that what it uh, is? Nyan Cat. Nyan yeah. Cat. I was like, this is hilarious. Like, <laughs> no one de- does that, and I, I appreciated it so much when I saw Thank it. Thank you. I mean, it's. I don't say that to negate. There's a lot of people who were really positive sure. and gave a lot of feedback, but it was. Just funny, <laughs> coupled with the people who were just like, uh, it was like the day the music died for memes <laughs> for them. <laughs> you killed all of yeah, those right on that me. wall. Yeah, it was, this is it. The beginning of the end for cool internet. <laughs> That's yeah. so funny. Yeah, it was funny. It was interesting. I mean, it was a little like, geez, guys. Really? Mm, yeah. How'd you find it anyways? Like, how'd you even oh, see? Well, <laughs> I had a friend of mine. I think it was Charlie. He would. Yeah, sent me like, hey, people are talking about it on Reddit. Seems mostly good. And the first two comments were pretty like, I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. But then as like more comments came in, people were just like, they're just, they just were like, it's cringy. It's terrible. Oh, my God. Yeah. And so I don't know. I mean, it's fine. People are allowed to to feel that way. And I think it's like an easy I don't know. I get, I, get, I get the perspective, I guess. I think they should be more happy that, like, their, the online culture is being represented in in reality, like, in, yeah. to the public. Yeah. You, I mean, you think, and you, some people are, you hope so. And, like, the intention of the wall is to, like, be beautiful. And if you're walking your dog, you know, you take a picture of your dog in front of the mural. I don't know. You know, that's, like, how it's supposed to function. Yeah, I don't know. It was, there was definitely, like, kind of two two camps of how it was received but if, if anything i think that's the best option right? that everyone's like okay yeah i'd rather piss someone off than have someone feel okay about my work right and you know? i i think it was just sort of like appropriate you know there is sort of this internet outrage <laughs> about i mean when i say internet outrage it was probably like 15 comments but um it's just sort of fitting you know mm-hmm. like time is a flat circle there <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Fix my hair so I don't no, look I'm stupid. Trying. Does my hair look stupid? I'm like no, always wondering. Like, it looks I'm, great. I have yours no looks idea. fine to okay. you. Yellow calic, but it's fine. It's because you have short hair. Yeah, I know. There's nothing I can. That calic just is. It's forever for me. But um, but yeah. So it was just interesting. It was. Yeah. Have you done any murals since then? Um, I've done a few things. There is one. Um, there's a new gallery which I hesitate to call it a mural, but De Novo, which is in that relative area over in Union Market. It's mm-hmm. a gallery that opened, and I did the logo on the side so it's their logo um and then there's a new build a vec which is an apartment building on h street where oh, yeah, Marta's it was a champion a, in yeah that. Marta's awesome um i had her on here yo yeah i did see that hey. i did a little research myself okay <laughs> um where they commissioned a piece that's underneath the stairwell so it's something that um is a new world for me you know that's since powwow it's been my first time um Mm -hmm. but it's something that is a really awesome challenge and an interesting complement to my fine arts practice and one of these days it'd be really cool to see if i could translate now that i have some basis for how long it might take to do a really realistic render um to try to translate a drawing onto a bigger canvas i think that'd be so funny i would geek the hell out if i saw like i don't know like that cersei thing on the side of a building i would (laughs) i would laugh my ass off like that'd be so funny I'd love to. And that's the thing where it's like, well, but who who out there wants that Cersei Mean Girls mashup on the side of their building? Yeah, I know, right? It's like, oh, well. Yeah. If they're style. listening, you can call and email me. What did you do for the EVEC? <laughs> did you do something like internet-based for that? No. That one was more aesthetic um, where they had a pretty good idea of what they were looking for. Mm. It's sort of a silhouetted girl and butterflies. Ah, yeah. uh, okay. A little, a little something more like hotel friendly right or apartment friendly whatever right. it is something that's just sort of beautiful aesthetic yeah yeah oh well, that's fine yeah. good for them but i feel like the mural game is at an all-time high right now definitely like, that is the thing if you are a i don't want to say visual artist, like a hand artist yeah, <laughs> i don't know yeah. what to call it <laughs> painter yeah muralist i guess Mural? but definitely dc and i'd be remiss if i didn't include the people who are in virginia but especially out in baltimore Really? They're, yeah, muralists who are wonderful. Like I'm, I'm dipping a toe in, but there's this whole community of people who are amazing 
um, muralists who do incredible stuff on the side of the building. There's a lot here and there's a lot in the DMV generally. Yeah. Well, Baltimore is a rundown place that has plenty of building walls to run, to paint yeah, on. They so do. They if anything, that looks a lot better in some of those areas. Yeah. And they've just, I mean, it's everywhere. I, I feel like, you know, when I'm there and I'm walking around, you see a lot, they do a good job integrating it kind of everywhere. Mm. You know, when you're in downtown DC, you don't really see it, but I mean, it's totally colloquial my experience walking around in baltimore but i feel like it's just integrated there in a way that it's not here in mm. dc um and part of that is like for the seat of government here so i don't know that you just put murals everywhere but but um but so we have a lot of really amazing beautiful awesome murals all over the place and in different businesses and restaurants and yeah everything. when did that become a thing like what what was the impetus because i don't get it it's like in the last five years or so yeah, me- murals are like the shit I don't know. I don't know if I'm the one to speak on it, but yeah, it does seem increasingly like you see it more and more right. everywhere. And I don't know, maybe it's just again with the continued evolution and integration of kind of social media, digital media, and that culture of if it exists well in a square and the feeling of like, I want that, I'm missing out. It'd be perfect for my business hotel. Oh, like you know, they'll maybe, identify. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, you like know, a- and you put, so I wonder if, that's a total guess. I'm again. I'm I'm only just starting to kind of get into doing, you know, larger scale mural works. But maybe that's something that's contributed to all over. We see them more on social media. Mm-hmm. Businesses are certainly seeing them too. There's, you know, hopefully, you know, arts in general is taken seriously anyway. But I just think the more that these things sort of exist within the public domains we interface with all the time, it's something that is more respected and wanted by the powers that be that, that pay for and commission these sorts of things. That's very true. You do see a lot more buildings putting very selfieable angel wings on things right. because they know you're going to go know. there just to take right. that photo or to show that they're with the culture or something. Right. And I, I think you see that even reflected in, you know, maybe you'll go see a museum or you'll see um, our tech house is a good example. Mm. And I don't, say this in any way as a negative but i do think that a lot of things i experience now in these sort of visual arts spaces are absolutely considering how it plays on a screen oh you know especially a vertical screen too right you know it's essentially free advertising for them to have me go to our tech house and take a cute selfie and put it up there and I'm tagging them and people see how amazing it looks in there and they want to go. It's such a component now. Right. And so I think that that, again, talking about how, you know, important social media is like, it's something that I think has made its way into. And for a good reason, like that's, If you see something looking beautiful, you want to go. You want to see. If you see everyone Mm. taking those angel wing selfies and you're a hotel, you want in on that too. So yeah, it's like it's like in a way, they realize that they want to be socially relevant online and get that marketing exposure. They have Mm -hmm. to engage with the audience through like an artist medium, like Arctic houses, uh, crazy visuals that make you want to be like, oh, look great. Right, Um, and which it's not to take away or negate that artists are making those things, but it it definitely, I think, is part of the overall consideration of how they market and exist, yeah. I I think it's, it's, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What is that beeping? Oh, it's a handicapped person backing up outside. Jesus. All right, stop beeping, dude. Damn. (laughs) For anyone listening, in case you guys don't know, we're on a street that has a homeless shelter on it. I don't know if you know that. It's like right across the street. I think they just hand out free stuff. So there's a lot of sketchy individuals hanging out on the street just doing some stuff. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't mean to insult homeless people or anything like that. But sometimes they interrupt my podcast. So they've got a bone to pick with them sometimes. But anyways, um, yeah, no, 100%. And I think it's I think that activation of being socially conscious of how mm-hmm. what you're doing is like transcribed to social media has given more power to artists, hence murals and hence activations and hence collaborations and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. Cause I feel like I see a lot of collaborations between brands and artists now too. Oh, for sure. And it's the same without social media. How does that happen? Mm -hmm. And so that's when we're talking about earlier, if you're a student now, it's possible you've already collaborated with Nike or whoever. Yeah. It's like, so how does, not to say your professors haven't done that as well, but it's like, if, if you've already done that walking in the door somewhere, it's like, well, 
Why would you? Can't nobody tell me anything. Yeah. So, um, do you are do you feel like you if you were to go to school now you'd go to art school or you would you would skip it? Um, you know, I would still, I would still do it, and I only have my BFA. There are times where I think about getting my master's. Um, really? Yeah, I think about it. I mean, I haven't acted on. I'm not thinking that seriously, but I think, um, you know, there's something to be said for being in an environment where you're consistently discussing you know what you're creating your whys to have people questioning what you're doing or having that critique or um you know meeting other artists ultimately when you all disperse out into the world those are people that you still know who are still friends of yours who are still you know a positive network whether that's for getting feedback on your work whether that's down saying. the road and you say hey i'm in a show can you participate too or just come and support or share best practices you know we're still a we're a community and it's a unique community you can't necessarily talk to just anybody about what it's like or if you need advice or if you're struggling with your artist statement you know, if you show that to your lay person, they're going to be like, why is it in third person? Yeah. Well, well, you know, so. But is there anything a master's of art would give you? Like, is there any actual benefit to that? Um, well, the one that's maybe the most tangible is like, should you choose to teach, you could. Um, oh, okay. And that maybe is a long-term goal. I think about it sometimes. But I think it's also, too, just finding a new community of people you know, to talk with and think about work with and to kind of re-delve into your practice and see about how it grows and expands. I mean, it's something that, again, I'm not thinking of it so seriously that I've done anything actionable yeah, about yeah, applying, but, it. you know, um, to just continue to know and grow and explore and learn and who knows what I don't know, I guess, mm. you know, what how the last time I've been in school is 10 years ago. So maybe there are new things to know um, that I just... Have you yeah. been operating as an artist in D.C. since Corcoran? Mm-hmm. Oh, why, why didn't you make the move to New York or uh, L.A. or anything like that? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I love D.C. Same. Yeah. And I think that we have every bit of the creative talent and potential and people that any other city has and we aren't known for that i mean again partly it's like government city but yeah why go and take what i think is an important thing to exist here and export it somewhere else mm. you know i think that you got to stay where you are i mean i'm from virginia not too too far a very different world than here but you know, I, I want the place that I've grown up and spent the huge biggest chunk of my adult life to be a great place for arts forever. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't hope somebody else does that. You know, you want to be there contributing, you know, being in galleries, supporting podcasts, having your friends be here too, you know, making sure that your local vote keeps somebody who cares about arts you know, in the local government, all those kinds of things. So I don't know. I love DC. Why, why not against those other places would love to exhibit there, but you know, I'm passionate about doing your art and where you're no, at. I very much agree. I'm from Virginia as well. And mm -hmm. so maybe you share the same sentiment where it, you, you always look at DC from right outside the gates, but you mm -hmm. never felt like you were a part of it. Mm -hmm. And so now that I'm living in DC, I feels it feels cool to be a part of that city. But right. it's like in a city that's so dominated by politics, in a way it kind of gives artists a lot of freedom because no one looks at us like for that. No one's giving us that look like, oh, you're in New York, you got good artists. People right. just assume politics. So it kind of right. gives us this weird underneath, like under the coat kind of thing where now we have free range to do whatever. Yeah, it's like very locals only. You don't, you don't come to visit... You come to walk the mall. You don't come to like go to our art galleries. Scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't come to, like like <laughs> New York. You might, yeah. But like we have our traditional art galleries mm -hmm. or like the uh, Smithsonian's right. and stuff like that. But we have so many more resources. But also, I love the idea that sentiment of being the change you want to see in your city, which I wholeheartedly agree with. Like that's 
why I love doing this podcast because mm-hmm. no one else is giving a voice to people like you or every other interesting artist or creative or someone doing something interesting. No one's really speaking on that or, you know, even doing events, you know, that's something that I always hated in DC is like, man, I really don't enjoy going to clubs. I really don't enjoy <laughs> going to Johnny Pistolas and having a bunch of 22 year olds spill their $5 gin and tonic on me. Like yeah. where can I just go to be in an environment where I could talk about, I talk with people, talk about ideas, look at great art and, and just kind of experience a different culture. Right. Yeah. I think it's somewhat the best kept secret of here. Like you were saying, mm-hmm. you know, that we do have an amazing art scene and I think you got to stay in it and keep working and be, be that art scene that you want. How has, how has, for, I guess you have, you have way more per- years of perspective on the art scene in DC. How have you seen it shift and sort of evolve since your time at Corcoran and, and now? Like, what, what have you noticed? Mm. If anything, maybe it's just... Yeah, that's an interesting question that... I mean, you've seen galleries kind of come and go. And I think in some ways, and again, it ties in kind of with social media, but things are so much more integrated now, the accessibility to the art scene and the artists and the institutions. And I think like that makes it so that, you know, there can even be like this past summer, a handful of local artists and myself were part of the rare crit exhibition at Hirshhorn. Um, and that's something that I think came about a lot of different ways, but you know, it's something that we could put on social media that visitors could put on social media that, you know, people can know who local artists are via social media. Well, There's sort of a collaborative. Okay. I don't even know that that's a change necessarily, but it's just different now having that be but, yeah. a facilitator between all different artists and institutions. And, you know, you can kind of, but that's go to a first Fridays and everyone can experience mm, it. You know, true. it's just integrated in a totally different way. But that's very unique that the Horshorn chose to work with artists like that because mm-hmm. traditionally these very institutional art galleries never reach out and work with local artists. Right. And I can't speak to the process of like how they chose or what they did, but you know, ultimately I think it's not a bad thing for artists to be existing on social media. You're findable. Mm-hmm. You can kind of gauge somebody's how much they're working, what their work looks like, all that type of stuff. And I think that that, you know, ultimately is a for anything, you know, it, it's, it's a good way to just sort of be a part of the community, be findable within it, and it sort of tethers together everything. You bring up a good point that kind of comes to my head when you say that. It's like, are you an internet-based artist or are you a real-life artist? And I, that brings up, mm. and let me clarify that, it's like, I know a lot of artists who just create art for Instagram or like art Mm. for a platform. Like they're not doing stuff like that. They're not being a part of shows. They're just kind of existing online. And some of them make good livings off of it too, which is really, it's really interesting to look at it like that. They're not in any galleries or work at the horse shore or anything like that. They're just, it's interesting. And it's, yeah. And you'll even see now like just online exhibitions. It doesn't exist in a brick and mortar. Online exhibitions. Really? Yeah. I've never seen that. What's that? I mean, essentially what it sounds like they will be, you know, whatever the platform is, whether it is a gallery or a magazine or a podcast hosts an exhibition, but it's, it's online. I mean, it exists on a, on a page and you scroll and look through it. There's nowhere like to physically go to see it. I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. Do you like that? Um, I mean, I think there's nothing like physically going somewhere to see work or yeah. have your work seen. But the reality is you're probably accessing a wider audience. I can't just walk into an L.A. gallery any day of the week to see a show, but I can see it online. So I think it's probably comes with its pros and cons like anything else, but I think it's a solid concept. I feel like that (sighs) takes away the magic from a show, though. Like the magic of the show is being with other people who are attracted to that show to talking about your art with other people like you're missing so much of that human yeah, sure. character and it's like <laughs> yeah. it's like oh you want an online gar- art gallery well let me just look up fine art on instagram how right. about that like you're just, it's like yeah it's like i want to it's you want to experience it and the social the component making and be there with the people and yeah for sure it loses all of that magic of being there but yeah. um in exchange you know it's everywhere 
True. So I, you know, it's one of those things. It's like I can't imagine ever being like <laughs> online exhibits only. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't do brick and mortar. I don't think anyone would do that. But um, I, I just think it's the reality of where we're at. And you think we're in a very expensive city. People Not everywhere money. can have a brick and mortar. Not True. everywhere can have the real estate and maybe be a nonprofit gallery or whatever. You know, and so I think it answers to some of the need for there to still be a space that uplifts and exhibits artwork and puts it out there at relative no or little cost to the place doing it. And there's also no cost or travel to anyone who wants to see it. The cost is the internet, you know, Mm. whatever you pay for that. So if you're someone who can't get off work or can't do whatever, I mean, I think that in some ways it's a very playing field leveling thing. You know, your art is everywhere. Anyone can see it. All it takes is the internet connection. But is it like they will open the web page at a certain time and be come oh to this website from five to seven and no, you can scroll it's, the it's finest like I think images it's up from you know this date to this date. I don't think it's like you get digital wine and cheese from five to seven. <laughs> yeah. Click to eat your yeah, cheese. Yeah, like, that'd be kind of sweet if they did. But you know the free booze and yeah, drinks are half the part, half the that, fun of those, of those, those really. traditional or maybe they'll like door dash you <laughs> five dollars worth of wine and cheese. I don't know. Yeah, that, 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 I don't, it's not quite like that. But yeah, that is part of the fun where there's like <laughs> hors d'oeuvres and wine. Yeah. I, and what that, but that's the traditional gallery. Setting. Yeah. Are, are you, are you concerned by that at all? Like being in those traditional galleries? Is that something that's on your mind? Um, how do you mean? Like, like when you're trying to map your career as an artist, like, are you thinking like, I need to get into this gallery? Or are you thinking like, I need to grow my online presence? Like, what's the, sort of thing there the thought really is kind of everything you know you want to make sure that you're creating a space where your work is seen online and that you know you're doing it in a way that is relative like you know I want to be online and support other artists and particularly local artists in a way that you know I hope we're all doing for each other but you want to grow your presence and your following and so that your art is eminently findable by anyone, people, galleries, art magazines, what have you. But of course you want it to be in as great of a space as known and celebrated of a space or gallery as it can possibly be. You know, your mm-hmm. goal is, you know, to go all the way. You want to like go to WrestleMania. I don't know. It's like, but, you but, want but the- <laughs> what is all the way for you? Like, is it like being represented by a big gallery? at Art Basel or something? Like, what is all the way for someone who's a traditional sort of painter like you? That's interesting. When you think about, like, goal setting, that's kind of like... I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm just no, cu- I'm, not I'm purely all. curious. I'm not, I'm like, offended. Curious. And I think it's, like, personal style where it's... I'm not one of those people who's, like, by this age, I'm this, and here is my true and one thing that I have to do. You know, I'm open and flexible. It's like, wow, of course, it'd be awesome to be represented by, you know, the right Is there there an Everest for you? Like in your, thinking about your art career, is there like an Everest where like if you got there, you'd be like, yes, like I made it. (sighs) I mean, yeah, maybe one of the like blue chippy or well-known experiences or galleries or biennials or what have you. I mean, any of that, but. You know, to say is there just like this one thing. I mean, everything is sort of that small celebration and forward momentum. I mean, more so than True. the the one thing I want more than anything is just consistent growth and momentum and expansion of my practice and hopefully uh, an appreciation around that. You know, nothing, I guess, would be worse than being stagnant. Well, to me, it's like it feels like impact right it, i think the best of what there, it, to me it seems like there's two worlds that have emerged and it's the traditional gallerist artist who's very blue chippy no one knows about them besides mm-hmm. the blue chippy people like very much i uh, hate social media but you sell for tons of money you probably live in some right. penthouse in new york somewhere <laughs> but there's also the artist who's social media famous and it's like a whole different world and they have kind of impact in a different way. Mm -hmm. And it kind of seems like those are the two worlds that we as artists have to think about at all times. And it's like, 
at what point is one more important? I mean, I think that's so individual and True. I, and I don't think they always exist in completely opposite worlds. I Not mean, they all. do Not and they all. don't, you know, doing one doesn't exclude the other, but to some degree, it's kind of like you're or myself, I'm trying to, you know, make the work first and foremost and share the work and you're hoping that it's viewed by any and everyone and mm. that whatever seeds it may plant that it it blooms as the right opportunity you know i don't think one or the other it maybe fits more in one space or the other i don't necessarily think the wrong opportunity finds you like people are going to look at Very your true. work and it reads however it reads you know, and if you're brand A and brand B, one's going to be like, yeah, that, that fits in this gallery or that fits to license images for our shirts or Because you know, well, like when I look at someone like you who is doing internet based work, like it seems so obvious to me, like the more you do that sort of concept, there's no reason why the internet wouldn't be like, yeah, like we really messed right. with her. But then all the blue chippy guys are like, we don't get it because we're all yeah. old and have tons of money. <laughs> And that's kind of, yeah, the internet sort of gets it. Social media sort of gets it. And then sometimes when it goes to a place that is maybe an institution or sort of exists, you know, with more structure and outside of that, you know, internet-based space, they don't know it's a meme. They think it's a self-portrait in a gutter. Oh, they think it's you like know, a so commentary like, or yeah, something? Yeah, you know, it's so, so it's funny. like that's where I think there is a dividing line. And that's where it's like, well, then maybe should you be fortunate to have an opportunity, it, it finds you because mm. you've sort of created the aesthetic or space or whatever it is. And that's why sort of how you react to art is important. That's how it's defined and placed, I guess. I don't know. I don't know if that's, (laughs) these are sort of deep questions that, um, even I wasn't prepared for these questions. We're just talking. (laughs) When I go home, I'll think of a million ways I could have more thoughtfully answered, but you're going to listen back to this podcast. Damn it. I've got the answer now. (laughs) Oh, could you just splice in the audio? Um, I'm going to blame it. Dub it onto me. I don't, yeah, I I don't know. You know, you just, you hope that that hard work and fortune finds you where it's supposed to be. Mm. I don't know that that's a very great answer, but that's sort of in the back of my mind as like you, you do the hard work and the legwork and, you apply to the things you can and do all the actionable things you can. And what else can you do? I don't know. Yeah. It's like, how do you create your own look in this mm-hmm. world? Like, how do you create that viral piece? How do you do it? Yeah. So, there's so many paths and possibilities. You just never know which one is the better one. Yeah. And I'm being so vague here, but like, <laughs> but you don't, it's like yeah. murals, gallery, pop-up art shows, merchandise, YouTube channel, Instagram, yeah. TikTok. It's like, which Photo one or should podcast. I? Yeah. Like, but you'd be silly if you weren't, you know, making sure you are on TikTok or making sure you're on Instagram or if I don't know that art really lends itself to Twitter, but there's a whole, you know, that's better for some things than others. You know, you have to I don't think Twitter's for art. I'm no, it's not. It's not. But yeah. other other jobs. Yeah. Uh, Sex workers. That's huge on Twitter. Well, there you go. And Twitter they should, if that's the case. I don't like I don't know too much about it. Oh, you don't know about that? No. Twitter's like so uncensored. There's so much pornography on there, which I I'm totally not on love. Twitter. But like that's where all the like only only fans and like cam girls oh, are on Twitter. He actually I think I did know a little bit about that. But yeah, I don't for me, Twitter's like not an art thing, so I'm not on it. <laughs> Same. Yeah. So that that and then when I look at it, it's always so like choppy and weird to read, but uh but you have to be if you're an artist or your own marketer. Yeah, I was actually I had part. a good conversation with my buddy Skojo uh, yesterday about he's trying to get on TikTok and he's trying to figure out his approach. Mm. And he's like, you know, I love TikTok. He sees the value in it right now. It's so hot and anyone can blow up on it right now. And he's like, yeah, I want to get into it. But he's like, I don't know how. And I'm like, dude, just do you it. Just have to do I'm it. like, just yeah. do it. I'm like, dude, you do like these awesome drips. Like, just show like a slow mo drip. People probably go crazy for stuff like that. Like, I feel like it's such a wild west. You know? I feel like it's always interesting. And this is on Instagram too. You know, if you're not an artist, even if you are an artist, like, I love watching, you know, how everyone creates is so different. Mm. That in progress video is so fascinating to see it all come together. And yeah. I think that is their perfect place to start for either, you know, people having that insight to the creative process. It can seem sort of wondrous and magical if you're not part of that world at all. And even if you are, it still is. That's like the way to go, I think. Yeah, I mean, if someone asked my Bruce, I'm an artist, where should I invest my, (laughs) 
my time into growing my brand, yeah, I'd be like, you'd say TikTok. I would say TikTok or YouTube at this point. Really? I'd say use Instagram as your portfolio. You know, use it, but don't dedicate your life to it because I literally saw my friend Sarah Barn Barnfart. Love her to death. She's been on the podcast, but she posts some racially ambiguous stuff. Not never. Sorry, not racially. Sorry, I take it back. But just edgy stuff. She posts edgy stuff. It's not racial at all. She's very much like pro femme feminist, like you know all that stuff. But they deleted her account, huh. and she literally lives and she's made herself slave to her instagram she's not on mm. youtube well you do have to like diversify you yeah know? like and anything <laughs> yeah and so when i saw that i felt so bad for her. by the same time i was like i told you yeah well, you... i interviewed her a year ago i was like sarah i told you don't put all your eggs in that basket because they could take it away you don't own it yeah you don't and who's to say the next photo sharing platform which is essentially what instagram is comes along yeah i mean okay well, yeah. let me answer that question if you're yeah. Bruce, i would say Whatever, I'd say try it, but whatever works for you. But what would work, I'd say TikTok is the thing right now. If you want just to figure it out and quick. <laughs> yeah. And YouTube if you're trying to invest long term. Right. Yeah, I'm not, I think about YouTube sometimes, but. It's a lot. It's a lot. That's a lot. That's truly a lot of work. It's a mature platform almost at this point. Yeah, it is. You know? It like, is. It's hard to, to. You know, it is a mature platform if you're like, and I'm going to start now. 2020 is the year that I'll be on YouTube. It's so mature. Like, people are so good at editing. Like, the kids who are, like, 18, 19 are creators. They've been editing since they were five. Yeah, like, so. They are amazing yeah. at Adobe Premiere. <laughs> yeah. They know cuts. They they're, know... like, 18 and they're bringing the heat. You yeah. Can't, yeah, I don't know if I'm equipped. But, like, TikTok, you could be, yeah. like posting your behind the scenes of you painting yeah you're seriously i'm sorry to keep but that's just the anchor point for it but like you could do that and people are like oh that's so sick mm -hmm. but is that cheating like if you got if, if you well i guess it's not cheating i'm presenting like the devil's advocate here is like if you got if you blew up off tiktok as an artist just because people really liked it and then you blew up in real life like is that cheating because it, the art world didn't blow you up but just people blew you up no i mean i think success is like success true i mean it does does it i mean i well, that's a that's a big like it's not cheating i don't think so either you know i think in a lot of ways social media has like little d democracy it's like you can access the widest market mm. you don't have to be represented by a gallery who might do that legwork for you that's you and theoretically you can make it happen however it is you can make it happen it's not cheating. There's your own hard work. I mean, you're really lucky if you're one video in and you blow up. But, you know, it's not as if you didn't spend the time, like, creating the video, downloading the app, making the art. How how could that be wrong? That power is in your hands to market yourself however. And if it works to send you all the way to the Whitney Biennial, like, good on you. Right. Yeah. Like, if you got there off your, off your social clout, then good for you. Right. Yeah. yeah, there's a dude on TikTok I saw. I don't know if you've seen him yet. He like, he he spins his canvases. He spins the canvas, and then he takes like a bucket of paint and he hangs it from the ceiling, and he sets it up so there's multiple colors in there, mm. and then he like, pushes it across the canvas and it creates these beautiful sort of streaks of color. Mm -hmm. And the behind the scenes is so cool. I'm like that guy's got millions of followers. Yeah. yeah like, and good for him. Yeah, good like, for him. Can't be mad if you didn't think of it first. Yeah, or like rock out. if it's not what you do, like I, you know, everyone's I don't know. You only can do what you do and hope that people engage with it. And if you do, then you're lucky. I, I love you having you. Hard. I love talking to you because we could talk about the intersection of art and like social media and mm -hmm. how this is like that's kind of what we've been talking about this whole time. Like it's yeah. so <laughs> it's like purely been about <laughs> yeah social media but and we've been talking about you yeah. too in there but like I, it's a conversation that most people can't have or even realize what's going on yeah and i mean sometimes it's hard because it's hard to step back and be at ten thousand feet for something you interface so deeply with every day yeah yeah so that's to wind it all the way back like what i i think is so fascinating and so very real about this intangible part of our lives mm, yeah Especially how everyone's sort of adapting it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like the Instagrammers, the visual artists had their moment on Instagram. And I think Instagram's kind of on its way out. Mm. But now the dancers are having their moment. Yeah. Now the sketch con people <laughs> are having their moment. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It. Yeah. And I often wonder like, and what's next? 
Right. Uh, what do you mean with as far as apps or as far as like co- online culture? Yeah, all, all the above. You know what's the next? Nothing's forever. You mm-hmm. know, Facebook's like nobody's on Facebook, and I think in a meaningful way, at Very least true. maybe not here in the United States. You know, it's expanded many places, and some places it's newer than others, but in a way that it's like sort of functionally cool and you're meaningfully engaged with it as you might be on TikTok or Instagram or whatever, mm. you know, everything sort of fades. You would yeah. never, you know, at peak MySpace, you would never assume this is going nowhere. Yeah, that it, uh. you know, so it's not to say that anything else is going nowhere, but it's not the last of it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, like TikTok is just Vine reinvented. It, mm-hmm. Things just kind of come full circle in that right. way. Huh. I also think that art, like the styles of art is changing. Like people are making more, what, what Gallus would say, street art inspired stuff now. Mm-hmm. Like stuff that more common people can comprehend. Like I feel like I see a lot less very nose in the air art anymore. Like very much like uh, abstract or portrait based. I feel a lot of things these days I see have bright colors and references mm-hmm. and iconic and in that vein. Yeah, I feel like I kind of see see it all you know i feel like there is a lot of like abstract and sort of abstract sculptural and um i'm trying to think of the right word but sort of that like outsider art look um are things that i i and who knows maybe it's like what you're it's my eye and it's no one else's eye. So maybe to me that stuff seems to stand out more than others. But I feel like I see a lot of that. Definitely like street art and murals too. Um, but that's interesting. I mean, I think like anything, there's trends within what's popular. And definitely I think there are things that are more uh, that are sort of like drawing one highly rendered eye like how <laughs> that's big on tiktok but also big on instagram and just in general big and if you're a high school girl drawing one highly rendered eye i don't know there's just some stuff that's like weirdly eternal oh i want to share there's a girl <laughs> on tiktok who i love you know she does she takes pokemon cards yeah and you know how on pokemon cards there's an image of like usually yeah. the pokemon is seen she finishes the scene on the Pokemon card. Oh, really? So she paints the rest of the card like it's to the match scene it to match with that's that. Awesome. Po- it's and then she sells them online. And she's making tons of money. Oh, I bet. And that's like it's perfect. There's your business model. It's I, perfect. I wish I knew her name. I'd shout her. Yeah. I, I love that. It's so ingenious. Yeah, it is. And it's like simple. It's right in its own like niche. If you love art and Pokemon, like there, there it is. So I want to talk more about like you and your art. What is sort of like your your process when you're creating, like when you decide to create? Like what does that look like for you? So there first is sort of image sourcing and I'll use a lot of like royalty free type imagery. Um, and then of course like memes or whatever, but file folder on my desktop full of just random everything. <laughs> um, but essentially what I'll do first is puzzling it together you know sometimes it's just kind of flipping through and seeing what grabs you or sometimes you'll see images and they seem very obvious I mean it's hard to describe when I see something and you're just kind of like aha that's it you know what I Mm. want to make um and sometimes it's puzzling it together you know I mentioned earlier I'll use photoshop to lay it all out and the big appeal there and maybe my baseline setting for everything is like I like having a lot of control and I don't go in, you know, like powwow. I watch people just freestyle murals. I was like, Whoa. that's scary. Could never with anything. I don't like to do that, but, um, puzzling it together and playing with it and creating exactly the composition that I would like, um, which essentially is just the reference for the drawing. Um, and then using that to, to create it, you know, knowing that it has those several elements and I've, thoroughly process through how I want it to look. Um, but it'll start just functionally how I make it is like that very base layer of alcohol based markers to kind of section out by color, what things will be. And I think that it adds saturation color boost to colored pencils and can kind of do like an undertone depending on what colors you're using. It seems like you, like you start 
framing the idea online, like mm-hmm. very via digital. Yes. And then you take it to the can or the canvas or whatever. Yeah. yeah. This next step you're talking about. Yeah, to the paper. So it's definitely a digital first thing Mm. you know and it's important to me to be referential right now it's not so much memes so much as these other ideas or things images um yeah that was like that was like that body of work at that time that's just what that was like that concept right and it sort of has been the place from which all other work has grown you know for a minute i was thinking like oh maybe i'm going in the direction of making work that's about like digital privacy but that was maybe three or four images that I drew that grew into something else. And that sort of just that finding and figuring out, like doing work that was pixelated, but it did That was awesome, by the way. Thank you. That pixelating work, I was so impressed when I saw Thank you. the Jeff Bezos one. And I think I, <laughs> I, I, think you. I saw the Mark yeah. Zuckerberg one in person. Yeah, that one was at uh, She Cake. Yeah, you hand drew pixels. That was, I was like, what? Yeah. The? Oh, this is crazy. That one, it was fun, but it was, I mean, you're just kind of filling in a, a grid, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it wasn't quite everything I wanted to say or do. It wasn't quite as punchy or impactful, or it, it just, it was that step that takes me to the next drawing, I think, or the series and where I've landed now. Um, And those are more, like I said, referential to the experience of being online. Um, And where are you now? You said where you landed now. What are, what's, can I ask about that inspiration or what you're kind of working on? So they're 15 by 15, primarily color pencil, but mixed media drawings. And they all have these deep black backgrounds and kind of describing something we're not seeing. But, uh, and that sort of, referential to the concept of like cyberspace or existing in deep space um and to kind of describe a few like the first one i did is this statue of atlas and he's shouldering the um iphone that has like the planet looking soap bubble um and in the background it's an abstraction it's hot pink but it's three w's as in world wide web um, but it's in this font called, I'm probably going to botch it, Ore King, I think, which is a pixelation based off of, I want to say, like Old English black letter. Um, and that sort of exists on like a hyperspacey looking grid. Um, but just thinking of how myth and evolution evolve, you know, over all time in humanity, sort of these tangible um objects that are artifacts or cultural reference points like atlas and sort of how we're shouldering this digital world this i love this that. atlas thank you because it was it was atlas holding uh if people don't know it's atlas he holds a globe he's like bending over but right. you did him holding a cell phone on the cell phone right. is like that that generic earth photo on yeah. your iphone i was like that's right. so genius. thank you and so that's where hopefully that one kind of and I could talk about some of the other, but that's where it's more touching that experience of like, I'm hoping it's, you know, on one side, you're thinking of these things that are tangible and real an actual sculpture of Atlas and actual phone, but how that digital space has integrated fully into that world as well. These things sort of exist in two places at once. And so there's one that's kind of about like simulation theory. There's one that's um, thinking about total disaster sort of doomsday scenarioing mm. it's like an explosion inside of a vibrant blue linear line globe and there's text around it that's from these facebook chat bots that sounded really scary <laughs> um where they're really only using a handful of words but they're sort of stand-ins for like binary and it was kind of creepy i mean ultimately there is nothing very amiss but they read as if they were like inventing their own language so it's sort of speaking to this notion of apocalypse, whether it's like this robot apocalypse or whether it's a climate apocalypse or whether it's an asteroid from space apocalypse. It's like any of these things. It's apocalypse everything. Right. Corona apocalypse. Right. Now. Exactly. You can't digitally get away from reading about, you know. You can't. Oh. Yeah. A pandemic. Yeah. And so it's sort of that um, that feeling of that unending anxiety of that that worst, that scenario hanging over you. And I think that that feeling that that worst or that outrage or that existential dread is like this weird undercurrent that exists on any digital media, news media, social media. And so um, that's the angle that 
I'm wanting to access again, like sort of how that these digital things are functionary and that's really cool. Yeah, I, I saw some of the samples you have on your Instagram. I think there was some on your website. I don't know mm-hmm. if there was or not. Or what, what, what platform I saw them on. I was like, oh, this is really cool. Are you working towards like an exhibition with that? Or what's the goal with that? I would like to. Ideally, I'd like them to be exhibited all together. I'm working on a sixth, because I have five so far, a sixth one right now, which is sort of about how we access and discuss tragedy. Um, I would like ideally for them to be a, a solo exhibition and you know those are things you apply for and you hope to get in so there's no like guarantee but in my ideal dream world that's how that would be but like in a legit gallery sure or anywhere that mm-hmm. yeah a legit gallery however you define it um <laughs> legit yeah. white walls and yeah, bad bad open hours yeah we're talking yeah the little wine and cups um <laughs> free wine and <laughs> little cups yeah but but Much like this ulti- exactly those are the actually this is literally the, the, this opening. Is the <laughs> opening cups the, <laughs> yeah. the, the clear solo cups mm-hmm. that's like the not little enough. short half glass yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. there it is you know they're in here um but yeah whatever that may be but ultimately i, I do want them together but on a long enough time span, you know, you can't presuppose something will come through. And if maybe one needs to be in a group show somewhere, you know, you have to be fairly flexible as an artist in thinking of, you know, is it right to wait for a year and a half to find the perfect thing? Or do you want that work to be out there and be enjoyed and exist and, you know, be amongst other work? Too. How long yeah. did that Atlas piece take you? Because it looks like it's done. How it long is did it, done. How many like, hours do you think that took you? Ooh, probably a lot. Um, it's not, that one hasn't been the most labor intensive, but I probably worked on it for, I'd say the better part of a month. But what, that, what? Yeah. You mean like, <laughs> like, oh, like maybe it's worked differently than my life. You okay. know, like it's not as if I'm 31 days of nothing okay, else. Okay. Like, I, I, I have a there. dog I walk in the yeah. middle of the day. I have like, you know, various other things that you do. I mean, you love an eight hour sit down day. Not every day is like an eight hour sit down day. Um, but there are some that maybe only take a, a week. It sort of depends on how much detail is in there. Some of them have a lot. The one I'm working on now, it's like, two guns that are mirrored and two oh, I saw that. smoke pillars that are mirrored and getting them to be look exactly alike is hard. That one has already passed a month mark. When I when I imagine <laughs> you drawing and I guess like I imagine you with or painting, sorry, it's like a tiny oh, oh. a really thin thing and you're just but like magnifying glasses on your <laughs> No, Straining. It's sitting this close. Yeah. So I have glasses now probably, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and like drawing it or painting it. It's now kind of a combo of both where they're primarily colored pencil, but I'll have paint pens and there's gouache and there's several things mixed in. Um, but yeah, some of them are quite, quite labor intensive and precise. So Generally, they're taking a couple weeks to a month, but sometimes if it has to be very exacting, it can be a little longer. Mm, okay. Especially if there's life happening around it, if there's like a mural project or seven family birthdays. Yeah. Oh, that's how it goes, <laughs> right? Whew. That's exciting. I can't wait to like see more of those. That's Thank so you. fun. Thank you. I'm feeling very excited about the series and what all is waiting in my digital desktop folder. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fun. Oh, man. Well... I feel like we, it's a good kind of <laughs> conclusion there. Yeah. I literally have nothing on my mind. I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's so cool. That's like, Thank you. Yeah, seriously. I, I also realized like when we started, I did not start off with my normal intro. We just kind of went into it, but it's okay. Like, <laughs> what I was did, your normal intro? I, I didn't go like, what's up guys? Welcome back to that scene goal. <laughs> we're here at Sarah Jane Jameson. Like, I didn't do, I was like, thank you. we were talking. I was like, oh shit. That's the intro. internet. You didn't go, hey guys. Yeah. <laughs> Why do we have to do <laughs> that? Know. Why can't we just flow you into didn't. it? You didn't. Look at you. You're just mold breaking. <laughs> I did it at the end. Yeah. Now everyone's going <laughs> to listen to an hour and a half podcast. I'm like, wait, who is this? Yeah. You can splice it in maybe. It's like, no, no worry. On the, on the audio only, I intro every episode. So oh, I'm nice. like, I, I speak to Sarah Jane. And then on the YouTube, it'll pop up. Like, you're all over yeah, there. I saw all the Yeah, all you, the you know how it works. Legit. Yeah. But yeah, you do have to laugh. That intro is always the, hi, guys. I know. It, it's so like, I was never sure if I should stop doing that or not because it feels so mood breaking. Like, yeah. it feels so, like, third wall breaking. Like, it, it kind of disconnects us. What do you us. do instead? <laughs> I don't know. Like, like Joe Rogan, he has, yeah. he, he's, he kind of starts off, he's like, he has, like, the dinner, 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 dinner. And then yeah. it's like, 
what's up? Like, he actually doesn't address the camera yeah, at all. Yeah, he doesn't. Which I like. But then I watch Adam from No Jumper, and he always goes, what's up, guys? Welcome back to No Jumper. Coolest podcast in the world. And then, and then that just goes into it. And then Logan Paul goes, what's up, guys? Welcome back to Impulsive, world's number one, the biggest, he goes, the number one podcast in the world. And he knows he's lying. Yeah. He knows like, he's lying. Why are you like, watch Logan Paul. <laughs> I am such a Logan Paul stan. Are you? I am. I am. I am. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I've never watched it, but I like, no, you know about him, I guess, you know, yeah. even if you've never watched. Do you watch a lot of YouTube stuff? Weirdly, no. Whoa. Yeah, weirdly, n- almost <laughs> never. I'll watch like music videos or live performance. Like lately, I've been watching like Blackpink videos, <laughs> which I don't know if you listen to K-pop. Oh, that's, yes, uh, Blackpink. Like Blackpink. Yeah. Uh, but honestly, I'm, no, I'm rarely on YouTube. Oh, I'm surprised. Yeah. It's everywhere else, I guess. Oh, like mostly Instagram and like TikTok now. Yeah. And just, yeah, I guess so. And like I'll I'll check up on like Reddit or whatever. I don't have like an account, but. Um, I'm a Reddit lurk. lurker too. I'm a lurker. Yeah, I'm a lurker. Too. It's better, I think. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, YouTube, weirdly, it's not one that, that like grabs me. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's like sometimes you just go in those K-pop holes where you're just, you're like, BTS video, yeah, Blackpink. Lately. Right? Or I'm just Baby like metal. laying around and I'm like, I don't know. Does it sheer and sound the same live? <laughs> <laughs> not that I'm not, you know, I'm not not a fan, but I'm not a fan. But I'm just I'm like, let me just see. <laughs> uh, so let's wrap this up. All right. All right, guys. Uh, hope you enjoyed this one. Please check <laughs> out Sarah on Instagram and everything. It'll be linked below. But the at is like at Sarah Jane Jameson. And that probably doesn't help you if you're like driving or anything like that. But it's mm. spelled very traditionally like you would think. Yeah, definitely. With an H. And yeah. my Jameson is with an I. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> go to the show notes or go down below. You'll find it. All right, guys. That's it. That's the angle. Thank Peace. you. Sweet. <laughs>